After you finished law school, you went on to some very prestigious clerkships. I had two wonderful judges for whom I clerked. Uh, the first was Judge Carl McGowan uh, on the D.C. Circuit. Being a woman and being from Dartmouth certainly helped me get that clerkship. There were, had been an article in the Harvard Crimson actually featuring Susan Estridge as the first woman president of the review, but it had a picture of all the officers and it identified our names and our colleges. Well, Carl McGowan had gone to Dartmouth. And when he saw that there was this woman on the Harvard Law Review who had gone to Dartmouth, he became intrigued and he called me up for an interview. The next clerkship with Justice Byron White. Yes, uh, how did that come about? That was serendipity again. Being a woman, again, probably helped. Um, so I applied to uh, four of the justices on the Supreme Court. I got an interview with two of them. One of them was Justice White. And when I came in for my interview, he said, I didn't want to cancel our interview because I wanted to meet you, but I have to tell you, I've already filled my woman's spot. So we had this nice interview anyway, and um, I just was looking around for things to do. I applied to be an assistant U.S. attorney in Washington. A call came in from Judge McGowan's office telling me that Justice White was trying to reach me and I should call him. Um, so I called and he asked me if I was still interested in the spot. So I went up and met with him again and had a great year clerking for him. So here you were, incredibly well fortified with your Harvard Law degree, your Master in Public Policy, your Harvard Law Review credentials, your two prestigious clerkships. Um, where did you launch your legal career? Well, the old girls network had just begun to work. When I was at the Kennedy School, um, there was a woman two years ahead of me, she was staying for her PhD, and she became uh, an economist at the Council of Economic Advisors. And uh, the council decided that they needed a lawyer who understood economics. And she recommended me for the job. Um, so I joined the Council of Economic Advisors. I was a called economist, but I was actually doing legal regulatory work. So I was looking around for what to do next, and I was going to go to work for the Treasury Secretary, um, whom I had met as his special assistant. When I got a call from one of my former professors at Harvard, Philip Heyman, criminal law professor, and he said, Kate, as you know, I've been appointed head of the criminal division in the Department of Justice. Would you like to come and be my special assistant? And I just said, yes. I was like a fly on the wall as Phil is deciding whether to let some U.S. attorney's office indict a senator, whether, for instance, whether the evidence was strong enough. As we were writing the first written guidance on use of informants, um, and subpoenaing of lawyers. Uh, we were actually exercising restraint on prosecutors. Um, and uh, that was great. So you took that, inspired by all of the high level policy making, and you took it where? A new administration came into town. Um, President Reagan had been elected, and he appointed a new person as head of the criminal division. Um, very nice guy, who said to me, I'm going to have my own special assistant. What would you like to do? And I said, um, well, I've applied to be an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. As you know, there's a hiring freeze. So he let me do criminal appeals for a while. And when the hiring freeze um, was lifted, I became an assistant U.S. attorney in New York. Giuliani came in as U.S. attorney, brought with him 100 FBI agents because he'd been at Maine Justice as associate attorney general. He had that kind of power. And he said, we're going after the mafia. Um, and he recruited me for that effort. And that's where I spent the rest of my time. So that takes us up to what, about 1985? And yeah. you made a big jump I, into academia. I did. I'd been out of law school at this point for seven years. And my, my dear first husband had been a professor. Um, and when he died, I helped finish a American political science textbook that he was co-writing. And I'd always had in the back of my mind, wouldn't it be great if I could vindicate Jeff, you know, become a, a law professor. And um, I got a call one day from Guido Calabresi, 
who the next year would become the dean of the Yale Law School. He invited me up for an interview, and um, I got a job. So how many faculty members were there at the law school when you started and you had your two or three other cohort, female cohorts? I would guess, including the clinical faculty, there were about 50. Describe the trajectory of your career. You start out non-tenured, you become tenured. So I had five years, maybe it was four years, and then you voted your fifth year at the time, um, to write my articles to get tenure. And I also had a baby my first year of teaching. And I remember going in to tell then Dean Calabresi that I was pregnant. And he said, that is so wonderful. It's going to change your life. What are you going to do about your teaching? I was actually hoping he would say, you only have to teach one course next term or maybe none. Yale did not have a maternity or paternity policy at the time. When you were uh, acting dean, you were the first woman to be so. So here's the thing about administration in universities. To be an administrator at a university basically means you're one of the people who returns phone calls. Um, and if you are such a person and you show up at meetings on time, then you're going to be called upon to do a lot of administration and a lot of committee work. I happen to enjoy it. I like to get things done. I like to try to improve things. Unlike many people, I've always respected authority. I've always admired the people who have to make sure that the railroads run on time. When you were um, serving as deputy dean or acting dean, did anybody challenge you as dean just because they thought they could take you on? I became acting dean at a perilous time. The stock market had dropped 25 percent. Uh, President Levin instructed that I was to cut the budget by 25 percent. I had to cut student activity budgets too. And so he wanted someone to be acting dean who did not want to stay as dean because the assumption was this person would make a lot of enemies. Um, and I didn't make a lot of enemies. Talk about your relationship with your students. Um, my students are wonderful. In 30 years, you can imagine how many students I've become close with. Um, I always have five or ten writing papers with me. I always have at least two, sometimes up to eight, research assistants, uh, and you become very close with those people. You, um, and if it works right, they're almost like your colleagues. Uh, so they're really smart. And one of my favorite courses is when I teach an advanced course in criminal law and procedure. I really feel I'm in the midst of uh, creative, critical thinking uh, that's as good as any faculty seminar. But you've also had a lot of non-academic undertakings, not the least of which was being president of the Connecticut Bar Foundation. Well, the first big one I did was be a commissioner of the Permanent Commission on the Status of Women in the State of Connecticut. Around the time I got tenure, I became the faculty sponsor of a new organization, the Women's Campaign School at Yale. And that was 1990, 1994, two years after I had tenure. It's still going strong. It's stronger than ever. We have women from virtually every state and now from six or seven foreign countries every year. Um, and I'm quite proud of that.